us this evening. Um, Nikki and Sanjeev, they're part of the team. They're out of the country. They'll be back uh, maybe one of the next meetings here. So they're out of the country um, on, on a visit. But um, Asif and myself are here. We're here in the Dallas area. Um, <clears throat> Jared is here in the background helping with some of the logistics of this meeting as well. And without further delay, Let's uh, bring on our amazing guest this evening, Kurt Riffle. Kurt holds a bachelor's de degree of business administration from Texas Tech University and a master's in accounting from the University of Texas, Dallas. He guides and advises real estate investors with tax planning and entity structure. Kurt's public accounting experience spans a number of different industries, but primarily focuses on real estate and multifamily syndicated partnerships. He has worked in public accounting over six years and holds a CPA license in the state of Texas. He is currently a tax manager at McCarthy, Rose and Mills, located in Frisco, Texas. And I think he's open to... Uh, answering one-on-one -on -one calls if you you know reach out to him after after the the call as well at his accounting firm and um Kurt would you go ahead and introduce yourself and um tell us yes. a little bit about your background and uh sure well Herb, thanks for inviting me to the show today uh my name is Kurt Riffle um I've been in public accounting for by seven-ish years now. And currently I work with a lot of multifamily syndication partnerships. Um, I deal with the tax reporting compliance part of that. So we'll take the books, uh, the bookkeeping records from operators and we'll put it into tax returns, create the K-1s that we hand out to the individual investors. Um, we're also, you know, obviously just to answer a lot of questions about that and, and how that all goes. So, uh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't uh, prepare anything. I, I We had talked briefly about kind of going through K-1s, possibly kind of like what a deal might typically look like from my perspective. Um, I can walk you through the process of, of what it looks like for our firm to receive the uh, profit and loss statement, general ledger, um, and the uh, trial balance and just kind of how that looks. But that's probably wouldn't be advantageous for most people is I think people probably have specific questions that they'd want to to know about from their perspective because I think typically what happens in the syndicated space is people will put up fifty thousand a hundred thousand uh, two hundred thousand um, dollars and they'll pull that money with lots of other investors and they'll go out and purchase something like an apartment complex and that's primarily what we see we see them hold it for three to four years and then they'll offload that property uh, hopefully for a big profit, and then move that money into their next deal. Um, it, I think it works really well for wealth building for um, general partners, people that are kind of running the deal, and then to a lesser extent, some of the limited partners. I think that they can get pretty decent returns from what I've seen. Uh, we've also come off like a really big you know, 10-year bull run for apartment uh, complexes. So I, I don't know how long that runway is or how long it'll last, but uh, I think people that have been in this space the last few years have enjoyed very nice gains uh, in that short time. Yes, and everyone post in the chat your questions about anything tax related. Please post your, your uh, questions or raise your hand you can raise your virtual hand on the call or raise it in the screen. If we can see you here, we'll uh, stop and um, answer your questions. So, Kurt, you Kurt, I have a question. Being a passive investor, like if passive investors also get a good benefit of tax depreciation or not? So, yeah, the depreciation gets administered to everybody 
in their pro rata profit loss percentage. And so everybody receives that depreciation. It's, it's whether or not that person can use the depreciation on the personal tax return. So as a limited investor or an LP, um, if they're not actively involved in the management of the, of the entity or the day-to-day -day operations, they, there might be some limitations on how much depreciation they can use for their personal tax return. Um, if they happen to be a real estate professional, that's a designated status, then they are, uh, some of those limitations are lifted and they're able to use that, all that depreciation um, in the year that they file their return. So for most LPs though, most limited partners, the expectation is that they would not be able to actively use that depreciation in the first year, that those losses would be carried forward. And then the year of disposition or the year of sale, that they'd be able to capture those at the year of disposition. So if they had a $100,000 loss, uh, it would carry forward to the next year and to the next year. And then if they sold it in year three, then they could, they could use that $100,000 loss against their capital gains or not necessarily their capital gains, but against um, all of their income for that, for that entity. Capital loss mean actually the loss happened on the investment, correct? Uh, I, I kind of misspoke. So it's not really a capital loss. It's, um, it's a passive loss that's carried forward. And so it doesn't necessarily offset capital gains, but what it would offset would be um, any income that they have. So it could be active, it could be passive. So it's just, it's, it's released at that time of sale. Okay. So let's suppose if they don't, they invested $100,000, their income is $200,000 annually, right? Mm -hmm. So the year when they invested, they are going to be getting a depreciation for 30%, 40%, whatever they did want right. to do it and carry out until, you know, three, four years. It's fine. I agree. But the time when they are going to sell the property, they are getting $100,000 off their principal, right, investment, plus 40 to 50% or 60% return of investment, correct? Now they have to, which is capital gain. So capital gain, they are going to be paying 22%. Okay. All right. I agree, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. 20% plus the 2.7% Medicare. Yes, correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then original 100,000, they have to pay the tax on that too? The, you, no, you will not be taxed on your capital contribution. So any return of the 100,000 of your original contribution, you're not taxed on the original contribution. Okay. Um, I, I uh, prepared some K-1s. These are real K-1s. If, any, if you'd like to see them, I can kind of go through an example of that. Let me see if I can share my screen. You should be able to now. I gave you access. <clears throat> okay. I can share screen two. Let me see if there's want something else I can share. Karina, go ahead with your, your question while he's bringing the loading the screen. Thank you. Um, so for the, uh, let's say in the example that was presented, if there, you get, say you earned 60,000 on it, can, is the write-offs that the um, partners, the losses that they took on the property, since you didn't personally lose anything, would you still be able to write off any of that or no? Um, could you re restate the question? You said something about 60,000. I didn't quite capture all the details. So say you put a hundred thousand, you invested a hundred thousand as a passive investor, and at the end of the term when they sold the the complex, you got back 160. So your profit is the 60%, which is what you'd get taxed on. The losses that are on the K1, I'm very new at this, so I'm mm -hmm. I may not be explaining it right, but um, so the losses that the entire investment, since you didn't lose personally, do you still get those write-offs or no? Yeah, no, absolutely. Because you are oh, okay. an owner, you're an investor of that partnership. So you are a percentage owner of the partnership total. So any of the losses that are incurred in that partnership, you'd get to 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 take those against your income. Um, your percent of investment. Correct. So this Got is, okay. uh, and thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you for sharing or asking that question. 
Um, so this might clear up some of that. This is this is going to be three years of of K ones. Uh, you've probably if you've invested in. Let me adjust something here. If you've invested in a partnership, then you've received a K one, and this is what the K one will look like. So I got three years. This is 2020, 2021, and the 2022, which is actually a final year partnership. So this is a very typical deal. And if you look at this person's percentage of ownership, it's going to be right here. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, but the profit loss initial starts at 0%. And then uh, they purchase it, and then they get 8.75%. 8, so their capital contribution uh, initially is 350000 So this is, this is a real person's K-1. I took it, and I changed the EIN, changed the name, changed this so that you know, nobody knows who this is. Um, so initially, they invested 350, and then that first year in box two is going to be the depreciation. So I would say 95% of this number right here, the 94,000, is actually depreciation. So this person is a passive investor; they're an LP, as noted by this box. It says LP; it's checked. And box two is the rental income for that year, and that 94,000 has lowered their capital account to 255838 down here at the bottom in uh, Schedule L. And uh, this 94,000, because they're passive, is gonna be locked up. Like it's gonna be carried forward on their personal tax return, most likely, most likely. 95% of the time, they'll be passive, it'll be carried forward. So now we go to the second year of the partnership. This is 2021. Um, partnerships going along, they're collecting rents, people are staying at their apartment. They've, they have debt here, this Q&R, Qualified Non-Recourse Financing. Looks like it's gone up a little bit. They've taken out a little bit more debt. Uh, looks like they might have some account payables. They have $5,900 for this partner. Their current year net income, looks like they kind of ran out at, at almost a almost net neutral, so only $726, but that includes depreciation. So uh, the cash return of that, maybe it was a few thousand, uh, but after depreciation, it was only down to 726. And then what ends up happening is in this final year, this is kind of where you're gonna see a lot of numbers start popping up on here. So if you're in your example, if they invested 100,000, got back 160, this person invested 350, and got back 580,000. Um, I also forgot to tell you that they got back 21,000 uh, in year two. So mm -hmm. 21,000 on 350 is, is a 6%. So 21 divided by 350 is 6% uh, plus this 580, $860. So they ended up getting about 600,000 out um, and they put in 350. But that doesn't mean that that their gain was. I'd have to do the math on six hundred minus three fifty. It's two fifty two. Ah, thank you. Two fifty two divided by the six hundred. That that's not necessarily what their gain is uh, when it comes to taxes, because there's a lot of preferential treatment for the uh, depreciation that was brought forward. So what a lot of real estate investors do is they'll take depreciation that was meant for year five, year six, year seven and they'll pull it forward. So now they're taking a lot of depreciation from the future and putting it into year one. And that's what these individuals did. But in the year of sale, they're gonna capture that back. So this is gonna be ordinary income in box one. And that's a lot of depreciation recapture. Pretty much all of that number is depreciation recapture from their five and 15 year assets. Uh, in the final year of sale, I think they had a lot of repairs and maintenance. It kind of really drove down their, their net rental income. So they actually had a, a pretty big loss, substantial loss in that final year. And then they also have more capital gains information down here. So yeah, as Charles had mentioned, the net gain was 252000 But uh, the way that it's presented on that final year it looks different than just a straight number 252. But if you add these up, you're going to get really close to 250,000. So you have the minus 94 that should be carried forward. 
from the first year, the 2020 year. Then there's little activity in 2021, and then a lot of activity. The minus 94 kind of cancels out that first 94, and you're just left with these three numbers to add up, and that equals right around uh, 260 or so. So it, it, you can kind of back into it, and you can kind of see in that final year of disposition um, how, it, how it's being treated at the end. So yes, you, your gain of, if you put in 100 and you took out 160, you know, in your head, like, a, okay, that's 60,000, that's a 60% return, maybe annualized, it's 25% or 30%. But the way it's presented for tax purposes, it, it'll look a little bit differently. It's going to be looked like more or less? More or less what? Well, the uh, the investment, because the guy just discussed with me in this afternoon, he's getting a $61,000, right, on his investment. Mm -hmm. But he has to pay tax on $87,000. Right. So this person, like I said, they made $252,000 gain, but they're paying tax on a $295,000 gain plus the $15,000, uh, I take that back. Yeah, plus the $15,000 unrecaptured 1250 gain plus ordinary income of 94,000 less 44,000 of uh, rental loss. So, if you add all of these up, yeah, it, it's significantly more than just the 250000 But he did not receive this money, right? Um, I mean, we can look at the, the this rental operated at a loss. So for that final year, I mean, all of these numbers are, we, we can tie it back. Like this is legitimately, this is what happened. So I'm not... Sure, if I follow, like in your example, somebody puts in a hundred thousand, and Charles, you might you might uh, weigh in if you like. What I usually think of it as, and and my my question would be, does this bonus depreciation actually do a new person any good? I'm of the opinion, not really. But in this particular case, he's going to start with two thirty five as his beginning capital, and he's going to end up. You flipped on me, and he's going to go to That's his right. last year and find out his gain is going to be that capital. From 235 to 580, and that's what he's going to be taxed on, more or less. So mm -hmm. that's your your big gain. But you do have all that depreciation sitting in the bucket that's going to offset that, which just really returns you back to your original basis. Depreciation lowers your basis. The return or uh, when you cash in your depreciation, you raise your basis back up. So you're you're pretty much returned to where you were to begin with. Yes, I agree with that. And you know, I think you also made a good point. Um, I, I can't give tax advice or financial investment advice, but I think a lot of the limited partners are not able to take the full effect of that depreciation well, in the first year. Well, um, it's I not necessarily the first year. It's the first deal. Like in my case, I had a deal that I sold and then I bought one. I get the depreciation. I can use it on the gains from the prior year. So it's right. if you're in the game, mm -hmm. you're on the merry-go-round and it helps. If yeah. you still have to step on that merry-go-round, do not get all that excited about that bonus depreciation stuff because it really isn't going to help you in the first deal. And sadly, for the person who's starting today, they're probably not going to see much in the benefit of bonus depreciation because it's disappearing. So by the time they sell this deal and they buy the next one, which is where you'll get the bonus that you might have used, it'll be small, 20, maybe 40, probably zero. That's 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 a very good point, yeah. The, uh, there's a sunset from the TCGA regarding bonus depreciation. Um, 2022, you're able to use 100% for five and 15 year assets. Mm -hmm. For 2023, that's already been being reduced to 80%. Yep. Um, and also, what Charles had brought up was uh, he's saying the merry go round. So, if you have active income, you can offset it with passive losses. So, you can capture some of those passive losses if you have passive income. So if you had two deals that closed, uh, one, you have a lot of gains from passive activity, and then you're being able to redeploy that into something that's going to give you passive losses, then you could capture that in the same year. So that, that's a good point. Yeah, well, uh, even as a passive, and I'm not a real estate professional, 
it's the sell of one, sale of one, and purchase of the next mixed together, and I get to delay it like a mini 1031. Yes, yes. And so I get to use the money. But the bigger deal is if they will take out a second loan on that puppy and hand me some money, I can invest that at no tax. You know, ultimately, I have to recapture it at the end, but I get to invest it, gain, have it grow, and then I get to pay it back after I've had it grow. Yeah, if you're if you're investing it, so there there are interest tracing rules, uh, separately stated interest things like that that uh, would be in the footnotes and disclosures on the K one. Um, but yes, there are uh, other benefits. So actually, what we are saying to the passive investors that they are going to get annually IRR about sixteen to twenty percent. It's not true. Because they are getting cash and cash, and they are getting uh, appreciation of the value of the property, but actually, end of the when they are going to sell it, there is no tax benefit for them. Very little, if it's their first deal. If it's their second deal, then there may be a benefit. So it's yes. all in what it is. It's just in the presentations where you got new people in there. It is highly oversold. Oh, bonus depreciation. Oh, yes, yes, Dude. I agree. Okay. So in but second, if we, to, if we go to the page two, the middle uh, K1, a mm -hmm. really cool thing to realize from my perspective is that you, know, you get you made 21000 and you're really only being taxed on 726 But that's after they did a bonus depreciation and took a lot of the stuff off the table. If they had not done that, you probably would have had enough to cover the full 21,000. And so what people say is, oh, but you're use, able to use that bon uh, able to use that stored up depreciation through the time of your thing. Well, you get regular depreciation that will cover most of it, not necessarily all of it, but most of it anyway. So it's also it's just another um, I don't want to say misrepresentation because they're not saying it on purpose or meanly or, or maliciously. It's just that mathematically, your your bonus depreciation really helps the 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 leads on the deal if they're uh, real estate professionals, and it will help the uh, serial passive investors somewhat like myself. But on your mm -hmm. first deal, it comes back. You know they're they're sort of misrepresenting it. But yeah. if if they are a passive investors and they have a first deal, it, and if because most of the time they don't receive ten thirty one. Correct. They will receive K one because in the yes. in the deal, they you know the syndicator is not going to issue the number of the ten thirty one. Correct. They normally don't do that. So in ten thirty one, they have only sixty days. Oh yeah, I mean it's not a ten thirty one, but it it effectively makes my tax disappear until the end of the next deal. Mm -hmm. I'm able to push it out for a period of time, which is the whole game of tax. Tax uh, eva avoidance, not evasion, avoidance. Yes, that's it. <laughs> now, is that for um, only qualified real estate investors or is it also for people that are W-2? Uh, right. W-2 is irrelevant. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, no, no, Charles, the, the point that Charles was making is, yeah, this would be something that a W-2 uh, employee or wage earner could employ because you have passive income and passive loss in the same year. So if you receive money from a sale and you're able to redeploy it before 1231 of that year, then yeah, Charles makes an interesting point. He's saying that it's kind of like a 1031 because you're you're able to kind of stretch that out longer. Um, but it's 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 not a 1031 at all. And let's not confuse that, but it has some of the same characteristics of it because he's able to capture some of the passive loss in the same year. Got it. Okay, thank you. But we will all be crying come another three years and it disappears. And then there will be people who do not understand the math and they will be really upset when it comes to taxes. And and, and we've also had a really nice runway for the last 10 years as far oh, yeah. as appreciation of assets and with mm -hmm. rising interest rates. Uh, some of the operators are, are really getting killed with the interest carry. So the, the amount of interest expenses doubled. And if you have $10 million of of a uh, of a loan or a fifteen or twenty million dollar loan, uh, six seven percent of that it's they're really big numbers. We're looking at a half million raising up to a million dollars a year just in interest expense. 
And I, I'm afraid some of the operators, you know, were not wise that they didn't get hedges for some of those mm -hmm. where they expected to be able to reset with a refinance. And when you go to refinance, it, when you previously had a 4% interest rate, now you have to refinance at a 7% interest rate. It's, uh, there might not be much money to be made in some of these deals. So. A fair amount of my money right now is going to the bank instead of to me, darn it. <laughs> yeah, it's also not a good time to own the bank, surprisingly. Banks are. Um, Karina, you said something about the expenses. And the deal on that is the expenses were subtracted out before you got your 60 in your example. So, yeah, you got the benefit of those expenses, but they didn't come on your tax form. They came on the, the entity's tax form, and then you got the profit that resulted. Hmm. So what is the best advice for the passive investors? The only reason the physician come to this, uh, uh, this real estate investment world that, okay, we have a tax benefit and we are going to get about 12 to 15% return of investment. So, well, go ahead. which is not true. Um, so a lot of, uh, professionals in the medical space, they're actually part of partnerships. So they actually have passive income. So when we talk to our attorneys and we talk to our doctors, they might own the practice or they might own the land. So they're actually, they might have a million dollars of passive income. And so they can offset that passive income with the passive loss from real estate. And that's not something that somebody that works at uh, as an engineer or as an architect can typically do. It's typically somebody that is already in an ownership structure, such as a partnership, uh, and they own uh, something like that. And that's very common for medical uh, doctors. But they have to offset with another income, correct? Another passive income. Yeah, but the way that their income is structured, they might get, let's say a medical doctor gets $200,000 from working at a hospital, and then they get six hundred thousand dollars because they're part of a medical group that um, you know their patients go to the outpatient clinic and they own the outpatient clinic. They're part of U.S. anesthesiologists or they're part of uh, U.S. Doctors Incorporated, and they own the building and the real estate, and they own the practice, and so they're they're just generating lots and lots of money outside of being a W-2 doctor, they're actually getting a lot of passive income, um, where it's, it's actually active income, but it's, it's, it's through other outside sources that's reported on a K-1. That makes sense. <laughs> so it's actually active income, right? <clears throat> other... It, it's a return on their investment of owning that big MRI machine in the office that it sits in. You know, if you ever get a test, you're going to sign a little form that says, you know, realize that your doctor owns this and it's not crooked because a few of them got so, sued a while back and now they make you sign that form. That's true. That's true. Oh, oh, oh. All right. So it means they have to have uh, some other right of passive incomes. Mm -hmm. Well, realize that when our our bonus depreciation disappears, mm -hmm. you're really going to be, the depreciation is going to be a lot smaller, you know, because each, it's just going to be annually. It's called going to be straight line, or I guess you get mm -hmm. double, what is it? Double depreciation. Double declining balance. balance stuff like yes. that. Double declining. Sorry, my, my accounting is way out of step, but <laughs> You know, you'll get some, but it won't be any of these big numbers that we've been having. And I think we all know Brad, and Brad buys these things, so he pays no taxes. And I just want to, I'm waiting to hear what the story is when we hit the zero, because he's going to be paying taxes, or at least he's going to be, you know, run off by the IRS or something. I mean, it's going to be a real interesting story. Um, but that will be starting after four year, right? If you buy well, anything after four year, that law is apply after four year, not to the one now. Well, yeah, but I mean, even let's say we go to next year where you're making 60%, mm -hmm. you buy that $10 million property and you're going to get the depreciation on uh, $6 million. 
and then the next year it's going to be on four million and the depreciation on two million. Well, you know, to, you're only going to get so much benefit out of that. Even the real estate professionals are going to start feeling some pain in this business. Correct. We need to come back. Well, I, you know, never, never feel how stupid Americans can be to elect the wrong person. <laughs> Sorry, never said a thing, so I apologize. <laughs> Kurt, could you uh, talk a little bit about cost segregation? Because we uh, mm -hmm. we get a lot of questions around cost segregation. Yes, absolutely. What it is, so, how it works, how it affects. So almost, I say almost, I, I think every single uh, real estate deal that we've seen closed in the last three years has had a cost segregation study uh, done. So a cost segregation study is a way to identify assets in that purchase that are shorter term than the entire term of the, of the building. So if you purchase a, a, an apartment complex, the term is 27 and a half years. So if you apply that to all of the assets there and you split out a portion for the land, um, let's say you take 15% of that value and call it land. So if you mm -hmm. paid $10, $10 million for an apartment complex, and you take 1.5 million will be for land, and then the 8.5 million will be for the 27 and a half year assets. So what a cost segregation study does is it goes and identifies the parking lot. It identifies some of the shrubbery and the trees and the landscaping and the fences and the pool and the pool furniture. It identifies the appliances that are in there, like the refrigerators and microwaves and the ovens and stoves. And then it also identifies the cabinets and cabinetry, and it assigns different values of life to those. So a stove typically won't last for 27 and a half years. So appliances usually get a five-year asset life. Um, and what that does is it you're able to uh, you're able to break that down by sorry, I just want to close that out. Uh, by the class life of those assets. And when we're saying that there's bonus depreciation, what we're what we're saying is those assets that were identified as being shorter term than 27 and a half years, you're able to take um, 100% of that in the first year. So I, I think I have one open. Let me see if I do. I can, uh, I can probably show you a few pages of one. Because... Um, I see hundreds of these each year. So we do hundreds of tax returns, mostly partnerships, also uh, deal with the individuals that own it. Um, and we also, you know, I do S corp returns and do C corp returns, but uh, see if I can find a cost seg and I might share a few pages with y'all. Okay, because that has something to do with the, that affects the K-1 as well, right? Because isn't that the first year after purchase? Yes, yeah, yeah, typically in the first year of the purchase, you can uh, order the cost seg. You can actually do it, from what I understand, any time after, and you can retroactively kind of take into account those assets. Uh, but if you're in year five and you identify five-year assets, then you probably already depreciated those. So I'll just kind of run through some of these. This is 159 pages. This was a really large um, uh, complex. This was a, like a $50 million uh, apartment complex. So you can kind of look at some of the components. They said fire extinguisher, uh, tile flooring, the exit sign, uh, can lights, uh, fire hydrant, sliding glass door. So they kind of go through and identify all the assets um, of it, and then they add them all up, and it will equal what they're taking. So they have landscaping, uh, retention pond, concrete pool deck. There's a shed on the property. So they look through all of those assets, and they kind of uh, identify how long is the life of those assets. You know, the, the concrete sidewalk might have a 15-year asset life. Uh, the landscaping typically will have a 15-year asset life. Uh, but some of these might have a 27 and a half year asset life. So it just kind of gets into the uh, identifying each of these components. Sorry about the, the view. And then breaking it out by, by what it is. So you can see that they've identified five years for the carpet pad, 
for the for the washer machine for the range hood five years for the microwave five years. So you kind of kind of get the picture, get the idea that they're identifying each of the assets within that, um, and then they're assigning a value to it. And so of the purchase price, if they purchased it for fifty million, maybe a million of that is the landscaping, maybe a million of that is the appliances. Um, and then you're able to, to take some of the bonus depreciation and bring some of the depreciation that you've taken your three and four and five and just put that depreciation into the first year. It's kind of a way to pull forward the depreciation that you would that you would have take and you're pulling it forward to the first year. Could you talk to us a little bit how that uh, benefits the passive investors as well or what that means? Uh -huh. So it, it kind of goes back to that uh the depreciation like that's the the name of the game for um i'll say 80 percent of what's talked about is depreciation so you're generating these big losses in some of the first years of operation and all it is it's kind of the deferred uh depreciation that's just brought forward so they're just bringing forward the depreciation into that first year and creating losses so from my perspective um if you're going to hold the asset for 20 years like there's probably not a benefit to doing a cost segregation, but if you're flipping these like every three years or five years and you're trying to get into new ones, then pulling the depreciation forward, there is some aspect of it that people find favorable um, uh, for them. But all it is is it's generating losses up front. It's generating depreciation up front that you would typically take in later years. And when you're going to sell it in three to five years, then you have to pay back because yeah. you already take the benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So based on 27 year asset life, but you're selling in a five year, so you need to pay back. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So if you take bonus depreciation and you hold it less than a year, or like let's say you hold it one year, um, Almost everything that you took as bonus depreciation will will be considered ordinary income. So that mm -hmm. from a from a, uh, but yeah, the converse of that is you're able to to offset like in a year of sale any of those losses against against active income. So there's there, there's no net benefit in that regard. It, it it seems to be one to one. So do we have a benefit for the capex? Like as far as like a limited partner? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So CapEx is an investment to, you know, improve the building. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it, a lot of that can be depreciated immediately to bonus depreciation. Um, so I think everyone has different investment objectives and risks. Um, so if you want to just hold the property for 20 years, then yeah, I mean, putting CapEx in and, and getting higher rents is, is favorable. If you want to get big losses up front and you want to depreciate a lot of stuff up front, then yeah, you can put CapEx in, buy new appliances, get a lot of losses generated. And I think that there's there's different reasons that people employ different strategies and, and different ways uh, to capitalize in real estate. I, uh, it's, I, I think it's still a great asset class to invest in. I, I think that people just have different views on what's more favorable. We do normally three to five year cycle. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've seen with our investors. They they want a three year cycle. They do want to to get in, make improvements, um, and then you know, raise rents and sell the asset. All right. Any other questions? Can we touch on uh, putting in retirement money, or is outside, or is that outside your bandwidth or bailiwick? Yeah, we can touch on that. Um, so we see it from a few different perspectives. Who asked that question? Guilty. Okay. <laughs> so we see um, IRAs. People will transfer money to an IRA, and then the money will come in. Um, uh, these are usually self-directed IRAs, so they'll have to set that up. Uh, they'll usually fund it through a few different mechanisms. They'll transfer money over from 
like a 401k. And then, well, I, I don't know if you can do that to an IRA. I'm not sure how the money gets into an IRA, but once it's in a self-directed IRA, then we will see that money come over to these investments. Uh, the, the tax implications for that can be kind of hairy. Um, let me see if I still have those here. So on some of these other pages, I'll show you a couple other pages of this K-1. So what we do is we include this right here. So if the money is pre-tax and you're using leverage, anytime you take debt, that's called leverage. And so if you if they purchase an asset and they take out a loan to purchase that asset, then you're leveraging your retirement account. And in order to do that, uh, you might have to file a Form 990-T. So a 990-T is for, or a Form 5500. These are some other forms that you might have to file if you have, uh, Form 5500, I think is greater than $250,000 of assets uh, that you're kind of in a self-directed uh, plan. And then some of this, like I'm a, not, I'm a little hairy on it, but I can tell you that this information would be included in a Form 990-T and we include it in our tax returns um, to kind of show you, uh, to give you, to help you fill out that 990-T. So if you use leverage or debt to purchase a property from your retirement account, then there's other uh, other requirements to file a tax return that you need to do. Um. I guess what I'm sort of fishing for, and I can do I can do some random numbers, but once you hit that uh, UDFI, you're going to pay a uh, tax on your gains relative or proportionally or prorated according to your leverage, which is what right. you were hitting on. Mm -hmm. But there's a there's a debate, and I've heard it go both ways. Do you is it going to be at forty percent, which is your normal tax rate at on a trust? approximately 40, yeah. or is it going to be approximately 20, which is your capital gain rate? I was lent, I've seen both arguments and I honestly don't know which one's right. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good question. I actually, I couldn't speak on that. So I, you're right okay. because it is a trust. So it is at the trust rates. The trust rates are very high. I think that capital gains are not favored or they're not taxed favorably in a trust. I don't believe. So I believe it's still going to be at that 37 to 39%. The people selling these things or selling the the, the services of doing uh, self-directeds, oh yeah, capital grains, no problem. But so far, having looked at trusts, I've never seen that rate pop up in them. So I'm a little curious as to what it really works out. But I'm of the opinion that if you do it this way, it is not going to be the big pop that you thought it was. Um, and, uh, and if it happens to be a, a tax deferred account, you will hate yourself in the future when you make too much money. Um, yeah. Mr. Ron D will be your problem. Yeah. So the you said I think UFDI. I I call it UBIT or unrelated business income tax. Right. So it's the portion. So yeah, you get the portion that's from your retirement account. That that's not taxed. Like that's taxed when you take it out. But mm -hmm. the portion that's leveraged, that's the portion that you pay tax on. So that's why you say how much income came from the finance part. And unfortunately, what you'll see is 85, 90% mm -hmm. um, is, is the leverage rate. So that's kind of what you're seeing as leverage is 85, 90%. Yep. They're a little lower right now, but yeah, it's it's up there. And you start taking that in, in the uh, trust rates. They don't go up slowly like they do for individuals. They go up sort of like uh, an F-16. So uh, you end up paying... A lot. If if the deal is successful, you will find out about how much you hate it. And if the deal is doesn't make any money, no problem. So it's uh, really weird. Can you explain the the what you're meaning by the leverage? And you said you take out a loan, like kind of in layman terms. So we have a hundred in a IRA. We passively invest it in a property. At the end, we get sixty back we're going to get taxed at that higher rate you're saying like the 45 percent on the 60. uh so again it's not the 60. you, you have to kind of look at the uh at the final k1 so this is the amounts so these would be so if it's in a 
a tax deferred account. Um, you, you also need to take into account these unrelated business income tax. So the money grows tax free inside of that uh, investment vehicle. But if you have unrelated business income tax, then you have to, to file a, a tax return for that. Um, for that. And if, and I think if your assets are over, I think 250,000, I think you also might have a form 5,500 that you need to file just to kind of identify our assets have grown to, to, the, to this amount. We've exceeded that amount. So now I have to file that form. I uh, just to let the IRS, it's like an informational return, just to say, hey, IRS, we have this much in assets. Um, however, you would pay income tax on the unrelated business income tax. So the business of of owning um, an asset is fine, but when you use leverage, when you use debt, anytime that a loan is taken out, that's considered leverage, then you would pay tax on the leveraged portion of that uh, of income that you create, or that's created. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only for the, on the leverage, right? Not in the principal. Well, right, only on the leverage part, but as I was as Charles the and I were part. discussing, it's yeah. eighty-five to ninety percent of the income is is the leverage part. Oh my God! Man. Uh, if if I may, if you draw a little box, four corners, and you put traditional on the left and Roth on the right, and IRA on the top, and four hundred one k on the bottom, because there's a self directed IRA and a solo four hundred one k. If you go to traditional, you get to pay uh, IRAs in both cases pay, I'm going to say it's UDFI, which is the evil cousin of UB, UBIT, but yes, it works out to be the same. And then um, on solo 401ks, no UBIT, no UDFI. So it's always advantageous to go to there to save that. But if you're on the, uh, on the, the side where it's traditional, they will come back to bite you on... Uh, uh, your RMDs when you get to be rich later on. So it's a really inconvenient thing to happen. And if you can get to a Roth solo 401k, I would actually say that's a good thing to do, but getting money into that thing costs you money because you can't convert, you can't move it from an IRA to a solo 401k as a Roth. You only can convert it into it from one to the other. So it, it comes back to bite you in most cases. All right. It's too much information. <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan of, of figuring out how to get it out of your uh, retirement. If you want to play in real estate, I vote on getting it out of your retirement, unless you can get it into a Roth solo, one for, a solo 401k. All right. Does that answer all your questions? I don't have any more. Awesome. Kurt, if I could add a screen share, yep. we would we will pick a winner for tonight for a nice. uh, gift card, Starbucks gift card. Here it comes. Can you all see the screen? Can you all see the spinning wheel? Yes. Okay, click the lever, spin. You see it spinning? Someone will win a $10 Starbucks gift card tonight. Kurt, it stopped on your name. <laughs> All right. That's fantastic. That's uh, Wheel of Fame on Google. So Google chose you tonight, Kurt. All right. And I will, uh, we will email a Starbucks gift card to you within the hour tonight. And the gift card is in the email. So you just take your phone to the Starbucks and let them scan it and, and uh, pay for your, your uh, drink at Starbucks. Awesome. Well, I appreciate and that. Next week's speaker, the 27th, is... Rebecca Moore, uh, Power Woman Talk. She is a owner of thousands of apartment units and will be sharing her story, a commute from California to Dallas 
for six years until now they're here in Dallas. Uh, but she has an amazing story. So tune in next week to hear her story. So anything else, Asif? No, I enjoy talking with him. I just need to learn more from Charles also how to save the money. Yeah, Thank I, you for putting up with me, Kurt. Uh, thanks for having me on tonight. Yeah, Charles obviously is a well-informed individual. Um, listen to whatever he has to say. He knows what he's talking about, most likely. So from what I can gather. And Kurt, saying. do you want to say share your email address with them? Or we can just forward your email address yeah. to information to yeah. everyone? Yeah, my email address is uh, criffle at mrmcpas.com. And uh, we're at McCarthy Rosen Mills in Frisco, Texas. If anyone has any, uh, you know, if anyone wants to ask us any questions. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Awesome. Thank Thanks. you so much, Kurt. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye.